what you're going to get is a flyover of basic water conflict and water diplomacy features with two key messages. So the first is that we have to understand water conflicts, and the second is that we have to transform them. To convince you of that, I'm going to go through two main topics. One is that water is a political resource, and the second is that water conflicts need our diplomacy. So I'll start off with water as a political resource. I say political and not biophysical because I'm being polemic here. I'm saying that scarcity is social. Absolutely, there's biophysical water scarcity. If you're a farmer, you plant crops and the rains don't come, your livelihood is at stake. All your effort, all your inputs is wasted. There's not enough water where it's needed. And absolutely, groundwater is the invisible resource that creates all this misunderstanding about biophysical water scarcity. But when it comes to water conflicts, there's a whole other side of scarcity. That's when there is enough water, but it's not getting to the people who need it. Like these kids who are standing on a transmission pipe, the pipe that takes water to your hotels in Mumbai when we stay there. We call this social water scarcity, political water scarcity, or economic water scarcity. We have a great ability. I'm, I'm absolutely sort of fascinated in a per possibly perverse way about how mean we can be to each other, how we can stop people from getting enough clean water based on how much money they have or based on their caste or their ethnicity, their religion, or their nationality. I guess the takeaway message from this slide is that water scarcity and water use is a distributional issue. Who gets how much clean water and why? The second reason I think water is a political resource is because the political economy drives how much we use water, whether sustainably or unsustainably. This is a classic example from uh, the good work that Nick Hepworth has done, except for March and April, when we can grow it here, April, May. Most of the asparagus that we buy comes from the Ica Valley in Peru, where it's grown extremely efficiently through irrigation. Great number of crops per drop. The groundwater isn't recharged by rain. It's, it's in the middle of a desert. The groundwater is pulled up and then distributed through drip irrigation to the root zone of each asparagus spear at exactly the right moment, at exactly the right time. Very high value crops, so it's also a lot of dollars, pounds per drop. It's so lucrative, in fact, that of course we can wrap it in styrofoam and ship it across the world, fly it to the UK, drive it out to East Anglia and into the local Tesco. So it's extremely lucrative. So lucrative that when the groundwater tables dropped beyond the economic value worth of the pumps, then the grower simply diverted the headwaters of the Amazon River because it was still profitable for them to do that. This is the economic system. As long as there is a dollar to be made and land and some sun, then of course you're going to use more water beyond the sustainable limits. You'll just reach further and further afield for the water. It happens again and again. Politics of this is that it's not regulated. This kind of water use is not regulated. It would be political suicide for the politicians in Peru, and it's just not on the radar for politicians in the UK to begin to regulate this trade. It's almost monotonous how regular you see this. The Aral Sea, Lake Urmia, the Dead Sea, Lake Chad to a degree, much less these days, but all these lakes drying up because of intensified agricultural use upstream, driven by the economy and not regulated by politics. You see it all over the place. Takeaway message here is don't blame climate change. I have to emphasize that because I hear governments, Syrian government, for example, before the crisis, taking people on climate change tours. I hear the media, I hear a lot of well-intended people blaming climate change for all the problems of the world. It's a very convenient truth. I mean, it is happening. We are responsible for it. But it's very, very convenient to deflect attention away from the decisions that we make, our policy and our political structures that are actually driving this unsustainable water use. And if it's a political economy that's driving unsustainable water use or sustainable water use, then we have to look for the obstacles and opportunities in that political economy. And there are many. Opportunity, for example, in food trade. So there's this concept of virtual water that Tony Allen at King's College London is responsible for conceiving. It's the amount of water required to grow or to produce a product. For instance, beer. It takes about 150 liters of water to produce about a pint of beer. That's because of all the water that's transpirated by the leaves of the barley that goes back up into the clouds and falls as rain again, the hydrological cycle. A big part of that is the transpiration of the moisture 
the roots of the crop, pulling out the water in the soil and transpirating it back up into the atmosphere. It's a huge consumptive use of water, 150 litres of water to produce half a litre of beer. Chicken is 10 times greater than that because of all the water that it's required to grow the feed for the chicken. And beef is even more so, 4,500 litres for one European size steak of beef. Shocking numbers, if you consider the fact that you drink 1,000 litres roughly of water every year, you might eat that equivalent of that today virtually at lunch. So three takeaway messages from the importance of water and food here. First might be eat less beef and drink more beer. And I could get on board with that. But the second is that we should be talking to farmers and looking at agriculture if we're interested in water conflicts and the big consumptive uses of water, as well as the distributional issues. And the third is that we should consider food in our diplomacy because it's an alternative virtual source of water. For instance, on the Nile River, we've calculated that the amount of wheat and beef that Egypt imports, if you convert that into water, it's about the equivalent of one third of the flow of the Nile River. And again, another invisible resource that nobody is usually counting, but one that I think can figure into diplomacy and does when you get right down into the nitty gritty of the processes. And I think it should. So that's water is the political economy writ large. Second point I want to make is that water conflicts need our diplomacy. They really need it because water conflicts ruin livelihoods and they drive political tensions, not war. There's a big debate, a very boring debate about whether water will cause the next war or not. It's probably not going to cause the next war, but it, the water conflicts are, driving, are ruining livelihoods and driving tensions and, and therefore deserve our attention. Consider the Tigris and Euphrates, these two mighty rivers that fall off southeastern Turkey, flow through Syria, and then down to Iraq, to the Shat al-Arab. The people there claim is the birthplace of civilization and into the Arabian or Persian Gulf, joined by tributaries on the Iranian side. These rivers are dammed just about as heavily as any other big rivers in the world, mostly first by Iraq and Syria, the downstream more powerful states at the time, more recently by Turkey and Iran. Iran is turning a lot of the rivers back in on themselves. Turkey is filling the Ilissu Dam as we speak. All of this is having a very negative impact on the downstream states, especially in Iraq. These farmers' livelihoods are being ruined. At one level, you hear things like, well, Turkey is growing food with the water that it's storing in its dams and actually making it available on the markets in Iraq. And so the farmers can still have food, but that doesn't do much for their livelihoods if they can even afford to buy the food. What's really interesting here is that there has been very little attention, very little diplomacy here. It's just sort of happening. The World Bank tried to get involved. The UN tried to get involved, but really there is no third party mediator. And it's a train wreck that we're watching happen. And the question is, does this have to be the future for other countries, like other downstream states, like Egypt and Palestine? So let's look at those rivers and see what's actually determining the use of the water or the, the distribution of the control over the flows. The Tigris and Euphrates, the most powerful country, is Turkey, and it's building the dams that Iraq and Syria had built 40 years earlier without any real challenge, of course, from those other countries. Iran is also a more powerful country in relation to Iraq. And in a way, fortunately, the damming in Turkey doesn't affect the flow in Iran. But the point being that Turkey, being the more powerful country, decides what's happening. On the Jordan, you've got five countries involved, and Israel locked in a very asymmetric distribution of the flows, roughly 90% for Israel, 10% for Palestinians. A lot of American diplomacy there. There was some British diplomacy at the time when I was involved, uh, but mostly it was the Americans calling the shot, of course, and haven't budged that asymmetric distribution whatsoever ever since 1995 when the negotiations began. And fully in favor of the American diplomacy I can say backing the Israeli position and not looking at alternative uses of water or guided by any other sort of international standards. Likewise, on the Nile, the most contentious basin in the world right now because of the dam that's being up built upstream in Ethiopia, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, long history of diplomacy there by the World Bank mostly fell apart before the revolution in Egypt. And then the implosion of Ethiopia building that dam and taking eight or nine years to build it, still under construction and lots and lots of diplomacy now, especially when 
the U.S. Treasury, not the U.S. State Department, but the U.S. Treasury got stepped in December of 2019, brought them all to Washington, tried to force an agreement that was clearly in favor of Egypt. So the, the, the current U.S. administration clearly favoring Egypt. Ethiopia didn't buy into the agreement, and the U.S. cut off all assistance to Ethiopia in August in an attempt to force them to the table. So watch this space. But don't watch it, get involved, because there is a political vacuum actually happening here. There's space for more objective diplomacy. And now power asymmetry exists. It's the fact of life. The question is, how do you encourage basin bullies to become basin leaders and to use that advantage they have from power for water benefit, for community of interests or shared sovereignty, these kinds of things. So takeaway message is that it's an unlevel playing field and that there's a diplomatic vacuum that I think the UK is pretty well placed to fill and is filling in some other basins. And now my last slide is that there are other tools that we can reach for, more objective standards like international water law. That's the UN Water Courses Convention, 1997, which tries to codify the right for upstream states to develop against the needs or the harm that would be felt by the downstream states. I mean, it's not easy to reconcile, but international water law tries to do that. It suggests that the distribution should be parceled out equitably and reasonably. So not equally, not that each of the 11 states in, on the Nile get one eleventh of the share of the Nile, because some states need it more, like Egypt. It doesn't rain in Egypt. But if you take into consideration the geographic factors, the needs for each state, and the access to alternative sources, you can come up with an equitable and reasonable share. So I think it's sensible, international water law. Several countries are supporting it. Several countries are opposed to it. It entered into force in 2014 when the 35th state acceded to it. The UK acceded to it in 2013, persuaded by some of the arguments by WWF and others. But the opposition to the Water Courses Convention is really interesting to look at because you'll see that if you consider the states that are opposed to it, US, for instance, India, Israel, Egypt, Turkey, all states that are satisfied with the status quo, not interested in challenging the situation. And so diplomacy continues unguided by any international standards. And as we've seen, the most influential diplomat country there has, has a lot of baggage, especially if they're not going to use international water law, possibly because of their disdain for it in relation to their agreements on water flows with Mexico and Canada, for example. So the last message I want to leave you with is that Water law is, isn't perfect. Not everyone's going to buy into it. You can't apply it automatically. But it's probably the least worst guide that we can reach for if we're serious about transforming conflicts. So I'll leave you to the last two points that I started with. We have to understand these water conflicts. We have to transform them. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.